Hi, everyone. This is Nick Langhalls. I'm the Program Director for Neural Engineering here at NINDS. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our Brain Initiative webinar series on technologies for recording and modulating neural activity. Uh, we have two presentations today. The first will be by Ellie Nadivi and Peter So from MIT on a strategy for monitoring synaptic activity across the full dendritic arbor. The, the structure of the presentation is that uh, we'll have about 20 minutes for um, both of the investigators to present and then approximately a 10-minute uh, session whereby our discussants will be allowed to ask questions. There won't be an open Q&A session, so if you do have any follow-up questions, please let us know after the fact and we can try and direct those to the appropriate investigators. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to our presenters for today. Uh, thank you. So um, Peter and I wanted to start with uh, a uh, kind of rationale for this project. So uh, we know that uh, neurons receives, uh, receives thousands of inputs, and uh, these inputs coming in across the dendrites are integrated into some sort of uh, de decision in the soma, which then gets propagated as an action potential. Um, it, it's something that's very difficult to study because it is impossible to actually record directly from every input on a neuron in thousands of electrodes across the dendrites. And so that, that's sort of been something that has been unapproachable um, using electrode type recording. Um, and I guess the best you can do is maybe record from the soma and maybe three or four dendrites in general. So the recent uh, um, development of Calcium indicators, especially genetically encoded calcium indicators, um, allow us to approach this problem. They're indicators that are um, based on the fact that uh, synaptic activity generates calcium transients that can then be detected by um, the indicators, which um, they're in various forms, rely on a, a fusion of a calcium binding protein and a fluorescent indicator. And uh, since they're genetically encoded, uh, we can use them for chronic monitoring of activity. Um, we can target them with cell type specificity. And uh, the um, indicators fill the entire cell, which means that we can potentially monitor activity not just at the soma, but across the dendrite. Um, in thinking about the time scale of how you would monitor this activity, um, if we think about the time scale of a single action potential, um, that would be on the range of a millisecond. If we look at the calcium transients, they are two orders of magnitude slower, which um, the single action potential is maybe not um, truly representative, but um, it means that you have a little more time in order to monitor um, the same number of uh, synaptic locations. Um, but we still would have to monitor the calcium transients at every synaptic site potentially on the dendrite. So, um, so what's the problem with monitoring 10,000 locations within 100 milliseconds? Uh, one is location sparsely distributed across uh, the neuronal volume. And actually, um, it would be difficult to monitor every volume um, without selecting the synaptic site specifically, it would be mechanically um, impossible to do that within this time frame. And it's a waste of time to scan the empty space outside the neuron. The other thing is that uh, in addition to um, scanning each specific location, we actually have to dwell at that location sufficient time to detect um, enough emissions um, to uh, generate a signal. And so, um, so how do we overcome these constraints? Well, um, one thing would be to selectively scan only the relevant points, so ignore the, all the empty volume, which would mean you'd be scanning fewer locations. And the problem is that um, 
in order to do that using the traditional Galvo systems that people use for uh, two-photon microscopy is that the mechanical parts are slow, and so moving from location to location takes too much time. Um, in the last couple of years, people have also introduced uh, um, AODs as a way to speed things up because there's no mechanical moving parts, but um, in the end, the um, uh, the light beam still has to be moved from location to location. So, um, so even though it's faster, um, you still need the movement from point to point, which takes time. So the solution is to um, scan uh, multiple synaptic sites in parallel um, to sort of do a multifocal um, excitation. And the question is how to do this in a targeted manner. So what we proposed is to create a synaptic coordinate map of the neuron um, where we would identify all the synaptic sites on the neuron, both excitatory and inhibitory, which would be relevant for the um, integration of the inputs across the arbor um, into the soma. Um, we developed a three-color labeling system where we uh, label the neurons um, with a cell fill and an uh, inhibitory synaptic marker, um, which in this case is uh, the cell fill is YFP, the um, gephrin, which is a postsynaptic scaffolding molecule for inhibitory synapses, is labeled with blue, uh, teal, and the excitatory synapses are labeled with M cherry. Um, they're in dio cassettes, and we put them at a high molar ratio in utero into L23 parental neurons. Um, with the low molar ratio of Cree so that we get sparse labeling of individual neurons, but um, the labeled neurons have all three uh, colors. And um, so we can uh, um, then use the traditional two-photon um, single-point scanning to get a high-resolution map. Um, we um, excite all three fluorophore simultaneously with two lasers, and we collect the emissions and separate them onto into three channels onto three separate PMTs. And um, we do that across the volume, and we generate, this is an example of a triple labeled neuron in vivo. You can see the cell body and axon initial segments are uh, very heavily uh, inhibitory innervated, so they can't come out as white here. When you look at the dendrites, you can see these puncta with the excitatory synapses here labeled in yellow and the inhibitory synapses um, in blue. And even when you go down to the uh, deepest basal dendrites on this cell, that would be about 270 uh, to 300 microns, you can still see the synaptic labels very clearly. Actually, when you pop out here, you can see the axon. Um, and the gluons. So we have a view of the entire neural and all the synaptic locations um, on this cell. Um, so how do we use this coordinate map to look at the synaptic activity? Um, we modify the labeling strategy so that um, we sacrifice one of the colors, which in this case would be the PSD95 label, since we still have a spine fill, and we introduce a red um, genetically encoded indicator. Um, so that now the neuron, it has a cell fill, it has the inhibitory synapse mark, and we can see the spines where the excitatory synapses are. Um, and at the same time, um, we could also monitor the, um, uh, the red calcium indicator, both at synaptic locations and um, in the soma. Um, now, the question is, now that we have this coordinate uh, map of where all the synapses are, uh, we have sort of a target locations for exciting, and um, how do we excite all these locations in parallel? So I will switch over a little bit, and so right now our instrumentation has two subsystems. So the first subsystem is... Uh, is um, surrounded by the dotted purple circle. So it is a selective scanning multifocal multifocal microscope. I will explain how it works in a minute. But we also have a second subsystem to help us register to the uh, coordinate map that we generated from high resolution. 
uh, coordinate map that we generated from pond scanning. Um, so, first of all, one of the things that we would like to do is to be able to excite all the synaptic locations that we are interested in. And typically, um, as uh, Ali had mentioned, we tend to have about 10 to the 4 locations in the neuron. So, generating 10 to the 4 excitation locations at the same time is probably a little bit too many. So, we divide the neuron, as I will show you a little bit later, into about 10 to 15 sections, about 10 microns for each section. So if you do a quick calculation, you need to excite about a few hundred to a thousand spots in the in that neuron. So the way that we approach that is to, because we already have the synaptic map, so we within that section, we already know where all the locations are. So we can actually do a holographic generation or 3D spot generation based on different algorithms. So uh, one of the very common one is the GS algorithm that by iteratively fully transform between the desired target location and a face map that we can project using a spatial light moderator, we can generate different spot distributions. So just a little movie that we generated of, uh, of uh, exciting a bunch of different arrow pointing at different direction at different depth. As you can see, we can generate many spots this way and at in, and in 3D. So one of the um, one of the question is how well we can generate these spots, and also uh, because one of the things that we need to be able to do is to be able to target a particular synaptic location. So given that typically, let's say the spine is on the order of our micron, um, one of the thing that one of the thing that we would like to measure is really how big is the size of the typical spot. So we did uh, some of the calibration and found that some of the spots that we generate is on the order about one micron in the lateral direction, about two and a half micron in the axial direction. So they roughly covers one of the spines, so roughly good size for us to be able to do. Another thing that it actually also matter a little bit that I'll go into that in a, a little bit more is uh, how uniform is the intensity of the spot generated um, we don't really want the intensity distribution to be very, very broad. Um, very dim excitation spot we cannot use, and, and very bright one probably generate more damage than we need. Um, so ultimately, we want to have a reasonably tight spot distribution, and certainly for um, a cell that is growing on a dish, uh, labeled it with rhodamine in this case, just we want to see whether we can pick up the rhodamine fluorescence. Um, for a 2D system, uh, we actually able to uh, generate a pretty uh, accurate location that maps exactly where we want the excitation to be. And we found that the distribution of the intensity is very bright. So you can see the uh, fluorescence excitation that should only occur if we manage to hit the dendrite accurately. As you can see, we can pretty much hit the dendrite. And of course, where there is no cell, you don't see any signal, which is good. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, so this is the strategy of um, imaging one single, uh, maybe 10 to 15 micron slab, and then for the typical cell at about 150 micron um, axial extent, we need about 10 slab per cell to cover the whole whole neuron. And if we if we let's say stay at about hundred milliseconds to image its lab, we have about um hundred milliseconds to be able to look at um one all the synaptic location of one cell. As Ali mentioned for calcium that I think exactly the time scale that we want. So I think one of the things that I should also mention is because our pixel, uh, in some way, our our synapse residence time is on the order of 10 milliseconds, that in general gives us much better signal to noise if we are doing raster scanning. So typically, raster scanning in many video array microscopes is on the order of one microsecond. So in principle, for equal labeling. Um, equal probe concentration, 
we have about 10 to the four times longer time to draw on each of the spots. So uh, we don't really gain that much because it depends on the choice of laser, but still that's one of the advantages that we have. So we have so that we can um, excite spot in 2D very accurately, but the question is how well can you excite spot in 3D? So this is um, just a simple uh, demonstration with a bunch of beads sitting in three dimensions that we again map the uh, um, 3D coordinate of them. And as you can see, uh, as we start to go back and excite all the different ones, they just light back up, which is uh, very good. Um, but one of the things that we found is um, our excitation intensity distribution for 2D is quite uniform. We have very few very bright ones and not too many 2D ones. But for the intensity distribution in 3D, we are not as tight as what we like. So we are still optimizing the algorithm to see whether we can improve on the, uh, on the intensity distribution that would in some way is the is the how fast we can go depends on the mean um, the mean excitation brightness that we have on each on the on the synapse and how many different patterns that we need to generate to cover one plane depends on how many very weak excitation spots that we have. So um, so as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we are imaging in a uh, each time we are exciting a, a, a plane or a slab that's about 15 micron in thickness. Um, and in order to have the resolution to resolve individual synapse um, on the dendrite, we need very high resolution imaging. So we typically using an objective with about 1.0 numerical aperture. And as you know, for a typical 1.0 numerical aperture objective, the depth of field is on the order a couple of microns. What that means is if we are exciting a spot that's on the top or, at, or the bottom of the slab, it would be very, very fuzzy, and the intensity that we de detect on the camera is very low. So in order to solve that problem and also give us some measurement of how what is the height of the of the spot, although we know that where the spot is, if we have the height of the spot, when there is a bunch of spot close together, we can actually resolve the signal from spots that's close laterally but separated in the axial dimension. So the way that we do it is based on a method that was in some way first developed by some of the super resolution imaging community. So what we do is in the imaging plane, we um, instead of putting a camera, we relay the imaging plane into another second camera, into a camera after a 4F relay, and within the 4F relay, we make a face plate based on um, what uh, double helix uh, gauss um, uh face uh, distribution, so that instead of a normal constant function, which is confined like American football in X, Y, and Z direction, the constant function is a double helix. Uh, distribution so that if you image a spot depends on whether it's on the focal plane or whether it's above or below focal plane it would generate two spots that's rotating and the rotation angle tells you how high it is so for example this is an example of image a number of fluorescence particles at different height and we can reconstruct them also very important if you compare let's say a, a 2d image of some of these particles you can see that some of them are very bright because they are in focus. Some of them, actually, there's a bunch of here that we don't see in the normal imaging, but if we use the Gauss-Lagrange plate, we can, number one, we have better signal. Number two is we can tell how far they are. So for example, this two is visible in this imaging modality where if we just do uh, put a camera, we wouldn't be able to see them at all. Um, so I think that works very well. So one of the issues is the point scanning system is not the same system that we are doing the holographic generation. Although we have a very high resolution um, um, synaptic map of the point scanning system, um, due to various, due to it's a different microscope system and potentially motion of the animal, 
we want to be able to periodically, very rapidly, fairly rapidly, we register the high resolution map to the coordinate in the holographic microscope. So and and so so that we would periodically make sure that we would be able to map in map to the mouse uh, right prior to doing holographic generation. So that's why we also have a live scanning temporal focusing microscope. Um, although its resolution today is not quite as good as the pulse scanning, but on the other hand, uh, it can allow us to do fairly fast structural imaging scans. So that is the second uh, part of the of this microscope system. We can allow us to do a high speed light scanning through it and allow us to register during the imaging section. So just um, to explain a little bit about what is temporal focusing. So the basic idea of two photon excitation is very simple. You fo you laterally focus a um, laser pulses along the lateral direction so that you have high peak power at the focal point. And then because the, um, the peak power is lower above and below the focal point, you have 3D resolution. So, but this is not the only way to ensure that you have high peak power only at the focal plane. The second way that was first developed by Silverberg Group and Chris Sue Group is by uh, controlling the dispersion of the laser pulses at different distance from the focal plane. So at the focal plane, we have femtosecond pulses so that the peak intensity is high, but the pulse width broadens so out when we go above and below the focal plane. So there are many ways to implement temporal focusing, but as it turns out, it's very simple to implement. So if uh, for wide field, not light scanning, for wide field temporal focusing, all you have to do is using a 4F relay again, conjugate a grading at the, at the conjugate plane of the image plane. And then when you have a ultra fast laser pulse coming in, the grading would uh, distribute the spectral component of the light into different locations, except at the focal plane, everything we can buy. And when all the light color we can buy that because of the time bandwidth product, when you have a large um, spectral spec, you have uh, narrow pulses. So you only have narrow pulses at the focal plane. Um, so this is what we could do. And so this is an image that we generated with uh, of the neuron in the mouse brain uh, by using the temporal focusing live field, uh, live scanning system. So we image this. Um, about 125 by 125 by 135 micron morium in about three minutes. And that allow us to quickly be registered the neuron to the new microscope. And then that allow us to uh, do, um, then allow us to do holographic imaging. So just as a comparison between the, what we can see with the pond scanning and the light scanning, the resolution is comparable. One of the issues with temporal focusing is if you look at the detail of the temporal focusing um, pulse function, is its rejection for background is not as good as the pond scanning system. We are working on that a little bit to improve that, uh, but I think that even at the current state, it's good enough for us to do the registration. So I think that. Okay, so uh, to summarize uh, what is already working for us. Uh, we can generate a synaptic coordinate map for targeting um, uh, locations in vivo, and we can do the in vivo line scanning also uh, for aligning uh, the coordinate map to the sample, and for also re-registration during um, activity imaging. Uh, the excitation the, with the pair of the parallel holographic excitation of about a thousand spots um, in its lab is working in vitro. Uh, we haven't tried it in vivo yet. So um, our challenges for now are to optimize the combination of the structural functional labels to minimize interference. So uh, we didn't go into it, but part of the um, issue with the, also with the excitation of a thousand spots is 
um, that it requires a lot of power, and so we have to use um, one of the high watt lasers, which is uh, basically a 1030. So we have to use a, um, a red um, gecko, and so uh, those are not quite as good, and so we have to optimize uh, conditions also um, so that we can get a maximal signal and not have the structural labels um, interfere. Um, but it's, it's looking pretty good. Um, the parallel holographic excitation, um, we are almost ready to take it in vivo at this point. And um, the uh, imaging of the slab sequentially using a piezo system, uh, we haven't really integrated yet um, into the system, but um, I think we could do pretty soon. And the uh, faceplate um, implementation um, is not fully done yet. Um, and thanks for your attention. Oh, and uh, before we uh, finish, <laughs> just to acknowledge the people working on this, um, this is been done by um, uh, Kaylin Berry, a student in my lab, and Yi Shu, a student in Peter's lab. Um, Jay Subramanian is our cloner, and uh, Yu Tukiguchi has been um, developing the faceplate, and Chris Rowland says this is a lot of advice. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Ellie and Peter. So at this point, we'll uh, go to our discussion point, and our two discussions for today are David Kleinfeld from UCSD and Yuri Buzaki from NYU. Uh, we'll start with David to ask some questions. Okay. Can you can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. Okay. Uh, very nice presentation. So, I mean, I guess the, the obvious question uh, that I had really has to do with the use of a, of a camera to detect uh, the signal. I mean, the scattering lens, you're already moving towards red light, um, picking up on Chris Hsu's work. So that gives you um, sort of a longer scattering lens than uh, exciting at 800, but exciting at uh, one micron. But the scattering lens is, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, is about 200 microns, and you said you were um, actually looking into your slab of tissue. The, the lowest slab was 270 to 300 microns down. So, I mean, at some point you're not going to be able to resolve individual spots. So do you, is there some trade-off that you've already started to think about uh, by only giving very sparse excitation? Um, and could you try to do this simultaneously? So I was wondering if you could comment on the trade-off of depth versus your ability to resolve spots. Yeah. Um, so, there are, so that actually is a very interesting question, David. Um, so there are. So we are at about 270. Our, I think we lose light. We are about one scattering length. Um, so, but uh, it so. So I guess a different way to think about scattering. One of them is how much light you lose. The other one is how much you blur out the sample. Um, I, in general, what we find is the point, the Fourier path maximum of the of the spot doesn't bother out too much. So we still see the spot, but the signal to background start to drop as we go deeper. So 270 to 300, I think we are still roughly okay for now. But the true question is, can we utilize the photon that gets uh, the by the tissue that are uh, distributed more broadly around the around the image? I think that's a very interesting question. We have not um, worked into that, yet, but one of the advantages for this particular application is, unlike normal imaging, we know all the coordinate maps, and we actually can control crystal maps. We paint, so we don't have to paint. So if we can rapidly paint different synapses and also take image rapidly, we can apply methods such as different type of comparative algorithms because we have a lot of higher information that we might be even able to extract some of the tempo fluctuation signal from the scattered photons. But uh, we have not really well into that in yet. But that would be something interesting to try to push a little bit deeper. Okay, and just as a sort of technical follow-up quickly, I mean, was, is there something you, you kind of you ran through that? I mean, there's only so much time. You had 20 minutes. 
you ran through the camera very quickly. Is there some um, special camera that you use? Is there some CMOS camera with pixel by pixel readouts? So uh, can... No, unfortunately, that is not one of those. Uh, so right now, the readout rate of the camera is about depends on the size we pick is between about. Um, so I'm right. It's on the order about 100 hertz. Um, so uh, so we could increase both sub region and go faster. So, uh, but uh, so uh, so right now we are pushing more for the lower background mm -hmm. read noise because our signal is not ready. So we want to have lower read noise and improve the signal to background. I'll let, uh, I'll let Yuri uh, ask his questions. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yuri, uh, you're on. Yuri, did you have uh, any questions for this presentation? No, I was preparing my questions for Michael Rukas. Sorry. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So we'll use that as a, a good segue uh, to transition to the next presentation, uh, where Michael Rukas from Caltech will present uh, on toward very large scale interrogation of neural circuits. Thank you. Maybe I'll yeah, no wrong with sharing. So, so Michael, um, we just transferred you the presenter privileges. If you could um, go ahead and share your screen, um, and we'll go ahead and get started with your presentation. Can you hear me? Yep, we hear you fine. Okay, great. Remind me how I turn my screen on, please. Um, so there should be a... Um, it's a quick start, if go, yeah. If you go to the quick start menu, there should be a share screen button um, that's next to the connect to audio. Do you now see the presentation screen or the presenter screen? The presentation screen, that looks great. Okay, Thanks. excellent. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, thanks, Yuri, for already thinking about questions you're going to nail me with. I look forward to it. <laughs> um, this is work um, that's being done uh, with a number of groups, uh, principally with um, Ken Shepard's group at uh, Columbia, uh, Andreas Tolius' neuroscience group at Baylor College of Medicine, and Joyce Poon's um, nanophotonics group at the University of Toronto. And we have a long-standing collaboration um, with the Billion Dollar Scale Research Foundry, which is um, uh, in Grenoble, CEA Leti. And uh, 10 years ago, I started um, what we're calling the Alliance for Nanosystems VLSI, Very Large Scale Integration, which has enabled us to do a bunch of things that I'll talk about. Okay. Get this too advanced. There we go. So I want to start with um, the interesting point. If you go and read Lord Adrian's, uh, we've got some problems with uh, fonts here. Okay, we've, uh, we'll move on regardless. Something's wrong with the font here. I hope the whole presentation doesn't uh, crap out. But anyway, if you read um, the, the part that's messed up down at the bottom below is pictured just as the citation for Sherrington uh, and Adrian for, uh, for their Nobel Prize in 1932, six years after the discovery of the first spikes for um, their discoveries regarding the function of neurons. And if you read Lord Adrian's um, Nobel lecture, he immediately identifies that it's not the individual neurons that he measured uh, and he got his Nobel Prize uh, for that is of interest. It's actually large numbers of neurons that are doing interesting things. So already he anticipated, you know, what we've been uh, proposing and trying to do within the brain initiative. Um, 
So what I'd like to talk about is a new and different paradigm for actually doing photonic functional imaging. Um, and it's a paradigm that will allow us to go deep beyond um, the penetration uh, of photons in, from free space imaging technologies, which even in two and three photon, uh, such as Chris Zhu talked about, you know, the hope is to get of order two millimeters deep. But uh, clearly that's uh, superficial for much of the work that wants to be done in the brain. Uh, and so we have a different uh, implantable uh, technology that we've been pursuing, uh, which I'll describe. Uh, and I'll describe how far we've gotten in terms of the technology uh, in this uh, Brain Initiative grant, which is supporting the work. But first, I want to describe the state of the art of implantable technologies for electrophysiology, because this is sort of the background work that we've done um, that gave us the insight into trying to push forward with doing implantable photonic devices. This is work um, done in collaboration uh, initially first with Gilles Laurent's group and then more recently with uh, Thano Siapa's group at Caltech, uh, again under the aegis of the uh, Alliance for Nano uh, Systems VLSI in LETI and in close collaboration with Ken Shepard and his group at Columbia. So, if you want to do something interesting with nanotechnology, which is what we're talking about, uh, you can do one of devices and prove interesting concepts. And what most people in nanoscience have done for mm -hmm. the last uh, 20 years or so is say, you know, this is interesting. Uh, someday an engineer will figure out how to make it useful. Of course, you know, after 20 years, somebody should actually figure out how to make nanotechnology useful. And that means actually building things up into systems, making them robust and regular. And so this is the reason why we started this Alliance for Nanosystems VLSI um, with this foundry and transferring a lot of the interesting sort of proof of concept, initial prototype university devices into robust things that could be mass produced. And I show here some integrated uh, nanomechanical systems devices that have now been incorporated into new generations of mass spectrometers um, and gas chromatography systems that have been uh, micro-miniaturized. So after we were pursuing um, at Caltech for about 15 years uh, developing electrophysiology probes and um, had some very interesting successes uh, uh, maybe three or four years ago that uh, we started then working with um, the Grenoble Research Foundry and transitioning to 8-inch, uh, 200-millimeter wafers. And so I show a picture of um, the emerging successful runs that came out in early 2015, uh, which were uh, 1,024, which are 1,024 channel, full-time, full-bandwidth channel uh, de uh, nanoprobe devices. And if you zoom in on these things, they're actually quite small. Uh, they have le electrodes that are at the micro scale, but large enough to give you impedances with proper plating down in the couple hundred k ohm ranges. And you know, you, if if you're not familiar with implantable technology, you have to remember that uh, microwire tetrodes, for which Nobel Prize you know a winning research has um, you know been generated, uh, have been used for a long time for chronic recordings, and that's basically to scale for these probes. So if the tetrodes are implanted slowly enough, uh, you know, and they're smooth enough on their edges, uh, and you know you don't do sur you don't cause bleeding with the surgery, uh, you can actually do chronic recording. And so that was the overarching charter that we actually used in in conceiving of our nanoscale um, or nanoprobe devices is that we wanted to go much smaller than the you know the previous state of the art of microscale devices initially started by. Um, Ken Wise when he was a graduate student at Stanford in 1963, and this led ultimately to the Michigan probes and NeuroNexus and so on. But those are still quite wide compared to what we're talking about here. And so the, the point of actually using the nanotechnology is to use nanowires so you could actually still have many, many uh, 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 electrodes on the probes. But I don't know, can you see my pointer here? These, this thing up here in the upper corner is a whole bunch of nanowires that actually connect up the shank, right? So obviously, if you have microwire technologies, you're not going to be able to put very many probes on. The form factor of these things is here's an 8-inch wafer on the left and a bunch of probes that have been plucked out. You look at an individual probe. This is what it looks like. And at the head here, 
is effectively using sort of state-of-the-art, almost state-of-the-art, one notch back from state-of-the-art, uh, technology where in one fell swoop you can actually make 256 connections uh, to the probe. And in the next generation we'll be making 1,024 connections all in one fell swoop. And that's important because our paradigm is to make the probes completely passive so they're cheap. They're of order $10, $20 a piece when we make them en masse as opposed to $1,000 a piece if you co-integrate CMOS. Uh, and there's no electronic heating because there's no active devices on these. these the, the active devices are off on the head stage. Of course, a probe is only a probe. What you need is a complete system. And so we've developed um, flexi cables to connect to these probes so they're uh, only weakly tethered um, you know, to the head stage and they can float basically physiologically. Um, uh, you know, with the pulsations and the, you know, the undulations of the brain. And, and then small, low-power head stages. The initial uh, head stages that were made in a paper that will be coming out soon um, were made using in-tan devices. For 256 channels, we had to use eight in-tan chips. Or on the right-hand side, we could make it a little smaller if we used the bare dies. But we've made a further advance since then, which is we've consolidated this all into one small two millimeter die. This is now a thousand channels, so it would require 32 in-tan chips to be equal to this, uh, and it weighs three milligrams. So this will make extremely small head stages. What you're looking at at the top of here is basically only the electrical connections. This is a three-dimensional structure made at the IBM foundry designed by the Shepard Group at Columbia. It has state-of-the-art performance in terms of voltage noise, its ability to do stimulation, and we can also do amperometric electrochemistry, which I'm not going to talk about today, but that's something else that we're actually uh, pursuing. Uh, and here's the guy that uh, actually developed it, David Tsai, postdoc, and Ken's group, and Ken Shepard. So what we have are um, these 256-channel layers. We can stack them. Uh, connect with each of the layers with flexi cables, stack four of them in order to make a 1,024 full-time full bandwidth recording uh, channel system. Uh, here's what it looks like with the in-tan chips. And if you zoom in, you can see the 3D shank array, four layers, 16 shanks. And if you look down at the shank tips, they're very straight. Uh, this is, took a bunch of careful engineering in order to make these very thin, long shanks. These are six, millime uh, six millimeters long. Uh, to, uh, to keep them straight so we could actually have a regular uh, grid of elect or a regular array of electrodes. And in this particular case, the shanks are uh, uh, separated by 250 microns. Initial results with this electrophysiology, uh, the bottom millimeter mm -hmm. was studded with uh, electrodes, uh, 64 sites per shank. And if you look on the right-hand side, 16 of those shanks were uh, arranged in four layers L1, L2, L3, L4. Those are the layers, not of the cortex, but of uh, uh, you know of the arrangement here. The first uh, shank uh, in the first layer uh, shows nice LFPs and also spiking when it actually goes through CA1 and CA3 in the hippocampus. This is uh, implanted in head fixed mouse in the Siapas group. Uh, and then uh, shank two, shank three, shank four for this first layer. Uh, also show nice data, and if you zoom in, you can see nice single unit activity for these probes, uh, and similarly for all the other uh, layers. Uh, and as I said, there's a paper that's been submitted um, on this work uh, that hopefully will be coming out shortly. Where do we sit in terms of what the state of the art is? Well, in terms of full-time, uh, simultaneously active channels, um, you know, we're up there with the state of the art. The other uh, point number two, at slight, slightly lower density, uh, is the work of my former student, Sotiris Masmanidis at UCLA. Where can we go with this? Well, right now we're at the 1,024 channels. Um, we uh, have a proposal in uh, which has been reviewed uh, very favorably, and so we're hopeful that. Uh, in the next round of brain funding, we'll be able to push forward and disseminate. The, the proposal we put in, it was for mass dissemination to the neuroscience community of these technologies. First, for the 256 channel layers, uh, 
that people can make 1,024 channel systems um, like we've done, but then going forward to increase the channel count over the next three years. I, we don't have the funding yet to do this. However, the physics department, of which I'm part of Caltech, has graciously given me enough money to do another run. And so at the beginning of 2017, even before we actually get set up, hopefully, uh, with a, a dissemination grant, uh, we're going to be able to provide to a small group of alpha adopters uh, some of this technology, including the head stage amplifiers. And so if you're interested, please send me an email message uh, and we can, um, we can talk. Now, the problem is that VLSI electronics can only be pushed so far. Uh, and the goal is to have many more channels would be to, you know, record from millions of neurons. For example, one of our paradigms is to record from cortical columns. And basically you need the sort of the rule of thumb, the empirical rule of thumb is you need essentially one electrode, even with optimal spike sorting, um, you know, technologies. When you have these multi-site arrays, you get one or one and a half units at best per electrode. And so if you have a cortical column in a mouse, a millimeter cube volume, you're going to need to put 75 to 100,000 wires in there in order to record from it, and that's just going to be prohibitive. Uh, you'll displace too much tissue, be too perturbative. So for these local kinds of questions of measuring densely brain circuits, how do we go beyond 100,000 channels? How do we address something like a cortical column? And this is where we came up with this idea of what we're calling integrated neurophotonics, which melds um, uh, essentially uh, using optical reporters with integrated nanophotonics to create these new types of imaging systems that can be implanted. So let me just remind you, functional imaging has uh, really surpassed uh, the number of units that could be recorded simultaneously, surpassed electrophysiology. Uh, for example, this work from 2013 from Janelia, 30,000 neurons, but the price you pay, of course, is you've got to get the photons in, and so this only works for transparent uh, specimens like uh, zebrafish larvae. Uh, why does it, can you only get the photons in these short distances? Well, this was discussed by Chris Hsu in his talk, and I, this is actually a plot from him. The absorption is not so bad in the visible wavelength, um, but what really kills you is the me scattering. And that, the composite gives you the attenuation link, which is only one or 200 uh, microns at best uh, in the visible range. And so when you think about trying to, in a freely moving um, uh, mouse, for example, uh, record deep in the brain, you just can't get there. You can record superficially from the cortex, but not anywhere deep with free space optics. And you can put a big, um, you know, if you will, cannula in and, uh, and try to do endoscopic imaging. Sorry, I hit the buttons too many times there. Endoscopic imaging, but that does all damaging on the surface. And so a different paradigm is required. And our paradigm is using these chronically tolerable ultra-narrow shanks as the uh, architecture, the framework for a new type of imaging system where we replace all of the electrical electrodes and nanowires and everything else with photonic circuit elements and build a complete imager in the brain that's anchored on these ultra-narrow shanks that can be tolerated for chronic recording. And on these shanks are embedded arrays of emitter and detector pixels. And so a cartoon for how this paradigm actually looks is as follows. Um, this is, we're imagining implanting the system with 25 shanks into, let's say, you know, the hippocampus of a mouse. Um, we have emitter uh, pixels that send out interrogating light beams, excite the chromophores in reporters, and then photons come back from the, uh, from the labeled neurons, encoding the information of the local activity, and we count those photons using uh, single photon avalanche diodes. And so, the components uh, zooming in on an individual shank, again, these are on the scale uh, smaller than um, sort of the, you know, the twisted uh, tetrode uh, microelectrodes, so they're chronically tolerable. We have photonic waveguides, which terminate in microemitted pixels that send out the light to do the excitation, either optogenetic stimulation or um, optical stimulation of reporter chromophores, and then the photons that come back from the reporters we count uh, in Geiger mode using microscale 
uh, photon counting single um, photon avalanche diodes. So our initial architecture that we proposed and were funded to do uh, uh, looked as follows, a 25 shank assembly that we designed with the objective of implanting with minimal volumetric exclusion in a one millimeter cube volume. So this particular uh, set of probes would exclude less than 1% of the volume of a cortical column. And the target is to have complete coverage of all activity of the 100,000 neurons in a mouse cortical column. Sort of a tall order, but we believe we can do it. The architecture we proposed was uh, 2,050 emitter pixels and 2,050 detector pixels. And I want to point out, again, that if we tried to do this with electrophysiology, we'd need 75,000 wires into that millimeter cube volume. We'd need 75,000 to 100,000 sites. Here we're saying with a 51 multiplicity that we think we can get, um, uh, we can do this with a far reduced set of recording um, uh, sites, these photonic recording sites. So how the paradigm works is as follows. We have, let's say, GCAM6 labeled neurons that are active. We have a set of emitter pixels, and we shine on patterned illumination, and we collect, count the photons that emit after these illumination pulses. And we can change the illumination pulses and do this hundreds of thousands of times on the time scale of an individual action potential because we're pulsing with two picosecond uh, light scale the, and the chromophores decay at the nanosecond scale. So that allows us to do many, many samples, oversample basically the system during each uh, action potential event. And then from all these photon counts uh, from our arrays of detector pixels, we demixed in order to understand what's going on. Okay, and what's going on meaning reconstructing the fluorescence time records that tell us what the neurons are doing. How well can we do this? So the first part of our effort was really to develop the, the theory and a computational formalism to actually do a quantitative analysis for how this was done. We did some preliminary stuff uh, you know, for our uh, proposal, but to actually do this quantitatively and to use that as a tool then to iterate the architecture designs. So let me tell you a little more detail about how the lensless nanoprobe-based imaging actually works. We have a photonic nanoprobe. We have a patterned illumination field that comes off of one pixel. And we have a pattern collection field that comes basically back into uh, uh, one of the single photon avalanche diodes from the intersection of the two, if there's neurons in that intersecting volume. And we call that intersection volume the illumination collection field. And so for an array of emitter pixels and detector pixels, we have a whole array, a multi-pixel pixel illumination collection field. Now, we think of these as our sensing voxels directly as you think of voxels in a standard imaging system. But the difference here is that these are sloppy, non-orthogonal voxels. In fact, we'd like to keep them as sloppy as possible to make our probe architecture as simple as possible. So we're only going to ramp up the complexity of these illumination collection fields to the degree that's necessary to actually uh, deconvolve or demix all the simultaneous activity you know, of the neurons that are within uh, a volume sub subtended by a collection of these probes. Let me point out the difference also to help give you some intuition about what's going on between conventional imaging and scanned imaging. So for conventional imaging, you use some broad illumination field. A flash bulb lights the room. You have a CCD at the back of your lens, and that defines basically, uh, you know, the lens defines a point spread function, and the pixels define how you actually break up the, uh, in the image field. Conversely, we can use a point to illuminate, scan that point around, either two photon or conformal, uh, uh, confocal microscopy, and then just use a broad collection field uh, knowing that we actually are restricting uh, what we excite, uh, the converse of what I just described for sort of camera-based imaging. For the lensless imaging, we're doing both. We restrict both the illumination and the collection fields. And given that I don't have too much time left, let me just say, you know, the illumination collection field is sort of the dual of either the optical transfer function or the point spread function for these more conventional or uh, more well-understood imaging things. 
So I've asked this question before. We don't want to make the technology any harder and more complex than it actually needs to be, because obviously, you know, this is some heavy lifting that we have to do in terms of large-scale integration of nanotechnology. So how crude can we make these illumination collection fields yet still demix and densely cover, you know, all of the, let's say, activity in a cortical column? So that's our goal. And that's with the simulations that we've developed and the linear demixing technology that we've developed allows us to do. To help you understand what this looks like, I'm showing here a top view down of, let's say, a millimeter cube of tissue with 24 of these shanks. You're looking at the cross-sections of the shanks penetrating into the tissue. And the increasing green color there is representing increasing neuronal labeling density. Okay? So from, in this case, from 5 to 25 percent. Okay? And so what we do with this architecture, then, is we assume standard cortical activity rates. We calculate, you know, with the flux that we can get from our emitter pixels, excitation of GCAMP6 chromophores that are densely labeled into the individual neuronal soma. We count the photons that are emitted at 515. We apply a linear demixing formalism that I'll talk about. And that allows us to determine the number of neurons that can be resolved. And we'll call these separable point sources. This linear demixing formalism was really developed by a postdoc in Andreas Tolles' group, Dmitry Yatsenko, who's been working really closely with folks in my group, Joe Redford, graduate student, and Laurent Moreau, who's a member of professional staff, a research physicist in my group. So I can summarize the results for the first proposed geometry, sorry for the little text problem here, using linear demixing for these different labeling densities on the x-axis and the y-axis, respectively. The x-axis is essentially the orthogonality of a given neuron with respect to the activity of all the other neurons. So we call that the source separability. If it's completely orthogonal, 90 degrees in some hyperspace compared to the activity of all other neurons, then the cosine of theta is 1, and you're at the far right-hand side. If it's not orthogonal, then that angle goes smaller and smaller, and then you go to the left-hand side. For the vertical axis, the signal-to-noise ratio goes from 1. We actually have the blue line there at 3 to give you a reasonable signal-to-noise ratio. So everything in the upper right-hand quadrant that's shaded green basically is separable. And what you can see is the labeling density increases from 5 percent to 15 percent to 25 percent. More and more of the neurons are basically can't be linearly demixed. Okay? So there's a problem in the initial geometry. But before I, you know, basically denigrate our initial architecture, let me say that here's a plot that represents Here's a plot that represents the effectiveness of this, and you can see at 10 percent we're following 10 percent separable. So if you only label 10 percent, you can pretty much almost get out all those 10 percent. But as you start labeling more and more, the background fluorescence starts to make things complicated. This is already a really, you know, a great milestone. 10,000, actually detecting in real time 10,000 neurons at arbitrarily high speed, only limited by the optogenetic reporters, would be a fantastic result. But we said we're going to do more. We said we're going to get 100 percent. So let's look into that a little bit further. How can we get 100 percent? Well, we need to increase what we call the spatial diversity, which means we need to make these illumination connections, collection fields, these voxels, a little bit tighter. Okay? And I'll tell you when I talk about the architecture how we make them tighter. So this first architecture that we originally proposed, which got us our funding, we see falls off as you go, there's 100,000 neurons in the cortical column. Here's 10 percent, 1,000. So we are there's... running a bit over time here, so if you could wrap up quickly, that would be good. Absolutely. We started a little late because of the question, but I, do, I will wrap up. Anyway, uh, I have a few more slides, but, but I'll finish. Anyway, uh, at, um, at uh, about 10 percent here, 10,000 neurons, you can see the first geometry falls down. 
So then we pick the second geometry, which I won't talk about, which does a little bit better, but it still falls down when we try to get to the full coverage of 100,000 neurons. But when we increase the spatial diversity, surprisingly with a smaller number of pixels, but we actually uh, change the e-pixel so we get, can actually scan the beams over nine positions, and I'll show you how we can do that, we can actually stay up very close to 100% um, uh, coverage, okay? So progress towards uh, realization. Um, we have effector uh, reporter excitation hardware. The hardware uses basically a technique where we use wavelength division multiplexing. We send a multispectral signal down a single optical fiber. Uh, these are demultiplexed on the chip mm -hmm. uh, using a various nanophotonic elements and actually allow us to deliver from these separate spectral signals uh, stimulation at different points along the shanks. Okay, and so basically what we're doing is we're taking the ops and absorption band and we're channelizing it. We're defining channels, separate channels that we're going to control within the ops and absorption band and then delivering these individual channels onto these photonic probes, okay, where they can actually then um, separately control little micro uh, emitters of light. There's the optical multiplexer. It's very small. It's about the same size as a recording pad on the electrophysiological probes, a single optical fiber going in. And so this gives us a multiplexing of one in, nine out, and we can do up to 500 when we go to foundry-based uh, 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 foundry fabrication. These are the microemitters uh, separated by about 200 microns. This is done by Iran Segev and the Kavli Nanoscience Institute, and we're now transferring it to the foundry. What's really surprising, and also the basis for our increased uh, uh, spatial diversity that we can actually achieve, is that we basically get lightsaber-like beams out of these micropixels. If you look at a single, these are fluorescein solutions, but we also show you in a moment, we've done this in brain tissue. If you look at the collimation of these light beams, even a half a millimeter away, they're still about the same size as a single soma. So we can think about basically stimulating individual uh, neurons doing optogenetics or stimulating uh, uh, just the chromophores within a, a neural soma uh, one at a time with these beams. And this shows um, uh, how the breadth of the beam evolves with distance away. And this is in this paper which has been submitted, uh, which if anyone wants, I can send a preprint. You could ask, why do we have lightsabers? People usually think that light is highly scattered inside. Well, it's because with me scattering at least up to a certain distance, by three orders of magnitude, it's highly forward scattered. And this is what we're actually using in order to get these lightsabers. We've used this to do single neuron stimulation. This is a collaboration with the Tolius group. We've imaged. GCAMP-6 using uh, two uh, scanning two-photon microscopy and inserted a photonic probe uh, to stimulate individual neurons. Again, I'm running short on time, so I'll just quickly run through there. These are, um, this is a mouse uh, cortex that's uh, co-expressing both GCAMP-6 and channel rhodopsin-2. Places that are yellow show the co-expression. And now when I show um, what happens when you actually stimulate, uh, these, this is with the probe. We're stimulating apparently some processes. One neuron lights up, that's the yellow, okay? And if you actually look at with the photonic probe, we can see nice stimulation of that individual neuron with the photonic probe. And then if we use broadband illumination, all of the neurons light up. So they're all active, but we're only stimulating one with the photonic probe. And we've also done uh, this in the Dyseroth lab. Uh, with electrophysiology. For our photon counting technology, um, Ken Shepard has developed over the last 10 years state-of-the-art CMOS-based microscale single photon uh, detectors that are extremely fast, response times on the picosecond scale, and this forms the basis for what we put on our shanks. We've gone to the IBM foundry using our brain uh, initiative fundings, developed chips, and then at Caltech, done the back-end processing to make shanks. Uh, we're in the process of testing these uh, at Columbia and at Caltech, and the initial tests look good. Uh, 
uh, we can actually shine light either broadband or on individual pixels and actually see that these things are actually working well. And so we're moving towards now actually doing um, in vitro uh, experiments to validate uh, their performance. The last couple of things I'll mention are how do we actually get this spatial diversity that I'm talking about. For the detector pixels, you put in uh, gratings, basically. And what the gratings do is at the bottom is the photodiode. Here's the grating. With incident radiation, uh, the radiation penetrates down to the photodiode. But if you come in at an angle with the radiation, it no longer penetrates. The transmission is actually suppressed. I'll do that again. Here's incident. And here's at an angle, it's suppressed, okay? And for increasing the uh, spatial diversity for our beams, how do we actually scan the beams around? Well, ba we basically make phased array gratings uh, for the emission, okay? And here's a simulation of how they work. And here's a laboratory demonstration just uh, cooked up very quickly. We haven't applied this yet. Uh, this is a screen which is a Kim wipe. <laughs> on a glass slide and uh, the photonic probe is beneath and as we scan just a few nanometers uh, in wavelength, we can actually steer the beam around. And this is work uh, done in my group um, uh, recently. So I'll conclude with saying where we are. With the electrophysiology, we can, we can and we believe we will get up in the next few years to disseminate uh, systems that have 100,000 channels to the neuroscience community, but we'd like to have millions of channels. And in order to get the site multiplicity that's required without putting in too many wires into the tissue, it has to be through a photonic paradigm. And so we propose to actually do a mouse cortical column, 100,000. We believe we're on track uh, with this first brain grant. And in the future, we'll do not only this lensless functional imaging, but we'll actually do, we'll resolve morphological imaging using probe-based two-photon uh, technology, but that requires some more heavy lifting of dispersion control for sub-picosecond uh, pulses on chip, and we'll have to write a future proposal to actually fund that work, but it's something that we're excited about doing. I want to stress that this is a general system. You can put any kind of reporter in there that you want, Fast reporters are going to be able to be tracked by the system because our, our uh, temporal dynamics are on the scale of picoseconds, right? So we're not going to be limited uh, by our readout system or scanning uh, lenses, uh, scanning mirrors, or, or um, you know, so on. So what we really can think of is a whole new generation of optical technologies, only limited by the reporters. For example, measuring membrane potentials. In effect, patching millions of neurons, doing local biochemical sensing, sensing forces associated with synaptogenesis, for, for example, and with microfluidics, which we can incorporate into this. Again, I didn't talk about it, local chemical stimulation. All this will become possible as the community develops better and better optical reporters and effectors. And I conclude um, mm -hmm. with uh, pictures of the wonderful people who have been contributing to this work. Thanks very much. Cool. Thank you, Michael. Uh, well, during the presentation, I believe Yuri lost the end of his laptop power, but he managed to call in. So uh, we can go ahead and turn over to him for questions. Uh, everybody who uses Silax would like to combine it with optogenetics. What are the immediate plans or at least plans for the near future to combine your probes with electrophysiology? I'll be in the two optogenetics. So it was ex extremely uh, broken up, and I didn't really understand your question. But I think you're asking me about combining the electrophysiology with the optogenetic stimulation. Yeah. Yeah. And and so that is in the dissemination proposal that's been reviewed favorably. And so we actually have a timeline and a roadmap for actually doing this co-integration. Now, do you have, Yuri, do you have some concern? I mean, the standard concern is, are you going to end up having electrical transients? Is that what you want to ask me about, or did you have another question you want to ask me about? Why? That would be the next question. The first question is, if you have separate optical sources and you have the recording side, there will be hundreds and thousands of neurons in between. Therefore, we are not really utilizing the power of optogenetics, because we don't exactly know what neurons we are stimulating. Mm 
Yeah, so so I in terms of combining electrophysiology with um the optogenetic stimulation, I'm what I'm offering is that is a paradigm that we can easily in the near term combine. You're right that we won't know where the neurons are unless we actually have some separate, you know, unless you're doing it in cortex and you do two photon imaging simultaneously. Um, but that's the reason why we are developing a complete imaging system on the probes that can be implanted and you can actually know where things are. Okay? So, yes, I agree with you. If you only have electrophysiology with, all, with the stimulation sites, you'll have to think about some. Uh, careful experiments for uh, with that the, the the utility of that will be much more limited than the general photonic probe technology that is the core of what we're trying to do nonetheless we can make that technology if you have interesting experiments that you want to do with it silicon devices active circuits don't like light yeah uh, in the photonic devices how do you deal with this because well, you, you number know, one yeah, that's a that's a great question. Number one, our paradigm is we don't have active circuits uh, on uh, you know f on our electrical probes. For the photonic probes, um, you know we will have the spads and the quenching circuits, right? And everything will be time gated, and we'll be able because we'll have you know uh, picosecond or uh, you know picosecond uh, scale electrical control, we can actually deal with the transients by, you know, uh, by time gating. I see. Uh, and, 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 yeah, uh, no. Any chance that you think you can stimulate through your recording sites in your probes? Mm -hmm. uh, and if so, then you need the, the 256 wires? Yeah. So, so are you going back to talking about the electrical probes, Yuri? Yeah. So. Um, Ken's chip and the Intan chips as well uh, provide for some level of simulation currents uh, that that can be delivered to the electrodes. And yes, so we can actually do that. And we're interested. So far, we've only used these for recording, not for stimulation. Um, but we're intending to use these for stimulation as well, or to provide them for stimulation as well. And so if you have insights about how best to configure um, the electrodes uh, to make them optimal for stimulation, you know, we're eager to talk with you about it and anybody else. And my last question is, when can we use your photonic uh, electrodes? The photonic probes right now are made at Caltech only, and we should you know, we're deep in um, development and discussion with um, the foundry to actually do the mass production of these. It's likely that we won't have our first batch produced, you know, large scale production of the photonic probes until 2017. Uh, but for, we're already working with a few people to deliver probes to them to do some interesting experiments, and I'd be, you know, happy to work with you, Yuri, and any, you know, anyone, a few other people. I can't, we, we don't have the capacity, uh, you know, to do large-scale deployment yet, but that is absolutely what we intend to do. So let me know. I could be the first volunteer. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you, Yuri. I believe okay, David Mike. also has a question that he wanted to chime in with as well. Uh, yeah, hi, Michael. It's uh, David Kleinfeld. Hi, David. Here with my lab. So I, um, I just have a couple. I just have a rather prosaic uh, question. Uh, we've, you know, we've used Ken Wise's probes in in, in the past, and I was uh, wanted to go back to the beginning of the talk and about the sensitivity of these high-density probes. So you had a slide, which we very cleverly used the uh, save screen to grab, um, called Gen 2 Head Stage Electronics. So you had the linearity and the, and, the, and, the, and, the no and the power, the noise power, et cetera. So the numbers that you give for the noise power, um, you know, around 10 to the minus 13 volts, volts squared per root hertz are uh, basically the numbers you get with wires, which um, which has been published on, but then you have an initial characterization. And the amplitude of the fluctuations, uh, if I understand this right, uh, are on the order of about a millivolt. 
uh, much, much greater than the quoted uh, noise level, which is around 10 microvolts RMF. But the height of the action potential that you record accessorially is about 100 microvolts. So, so somehow something is off that, the, okay. that the, the characterization noise seems an order of magnitude bigger than the action potential noise. So I was wondering if you could uh, just clarify this, this issue so it, it really uh, sets the scale for how one could use these. Yeah, exactly. Well, I may have actually goofed up on the numbers in the slide. And I don't have the numbers with me because this is technology from Columbia, but it, I will assure you that they have been designed. These have not yet been used. We've been using so far only the intan chips uh, with the probes that we've done before, but these are designed to actually exceed the specs of the intan chips, but in a much smaller form factor. So um, we can, if you want, take this offline and include Ken and David, who were the guys that actually designed it and fabbed it at the IBM Foundry uh, okay. to discuss. You know, but but I I am assured that in fact the the numbers that I actually quote in that slide. I, by the way, it's very astute of you to to do the uh, screen screen grab. Very good. I, I applaud that. Anyway, the because things went by very quickly. The um, uh, the numbers that are quoted in that little figure there, though, are for the, for the LFP band and for the spiking band, integrated across the band. And, yeah. and that's what I'm, yeah. Okay, I'm not so sure where you're getting the millivolt, because it's actually smaller than that. Yeah. All right, no, we could just settle it, maybe like, uh, yeah. outside, maybe just mislabel. The other question yeah. I had is when you get to these small... But, but let, me, let me say this. You know, let's say the first generation doesn't work, uh, you know, uh, or doesn't have quite good enough noise performance. You know, this is, uh, Ken has done, by the way, 65,000 chips for doing retinal uh, recordings. And this is the first generation of a chip for a, a, a really small, low, uh, high channel count and low mass, small volume head stage amplifier, right? And we will yeah. be able to successively improve that using state-of-the-art electronics because can, can, we can has access to that. Okay, so it's obviously you know where our goal is to make uh, the best uh, possible with high channel count and extremely low power dissipation. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not questioning your talent. Yeah, I remember your oh, your phonon uh, uh, detectors from uh, 20 years ago. So. Um, but I, then the other question is: Is there um, what, if you could comment on uh, crosstalk between channels at, at these sort yeah. of high density levels? Is this um, is this become a limiting factor in the number of channels you could put on the probe? Oh, it's it's important, and we've modeled the capacitive coupling between the, between these nanowires, these long nanowires that go up the long shanks. Um, this actually gives me a good opportunity to say that. If we are funded, and I guess we're going to know next month, uh, one of the first things that we're going to do for people that are interested in work in monkeys is actually to uh, do short loops to develop um, um, centimeter long, 10 millimeter long probes for monkeys. Now I bring that up because, of course, the longer uh, you are, the more uh, mutual capacitance you have between the lines. If we go up to from 256 electrodes per probe. Uh, you know, with our current 300 nanometer wide uh, nanowires going up to the top, and we d we're going to have to reduce that to 100 nanometers to actually put 1,000 channels uh, on a probe, the mutual capacitance will actually have to be worried about. So far with our modeling and with our initial experiments, it's not a problem. It's, you know, it's below sort of the background noise uh, of the system. But it is something that we have definitely, it's part of our design loop to actually evaluate, um, you know, what these channel-to-channel -channel couplings are. They're, they're not zero, they're, but to engineer them so they're below all the other noise issues that one faces when one does electrophysiology. Let me, let me summarize. It's, it's on our radar, radar screen, and we're actually taking this to, into account in our designs. And so far, it's okay. We may, when we try to get up to the 100,000 channel electrophysiology system, we'll see. We have not done yet the, these kinds of mutual uh, coupling calculations for the 100,000 channel system. It could pose a problem there. We don't know yet. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. Sure.
Cool. Well, uh, we're, we're definitely running a, a bit over, so I apologize that we, we took uh, more time, but hopefully everyone enjoyed the presentations. I'd like to thank Ellie, Peter, and Michael for presenting, as well as both David and Yuri for uh, signing on to be the discussants this week. Uh, we're going to have another session in two weeks. Um, presenters uh, will be announced, and the registration information will come around, and then we're going to take the month of August off so uh, before coming back in September. So once again, thank you all for joining, and uh, have a good weekend. Thanks.